You know, as we sit here on the eve of what could be Ron Rivera's last game as the coach of the Washington Commanders, I thought, what better time to go over an article from Hogs Haven that I had a chance to catch a few days back from a buddy of mine, uh, Kyle Smith for GM. It is a screen name, but I feel it's important for him to get some credit for the article he put out here. It was actually a really good piece here. And it talks about Ron Rivera's top 10 worst decisions in DC. And I'm going to say that, you know, this is a really good read. If you have a chance, come over and check it out. But I thought it would be a great idea to come on and take a look at this list and kind of go through and, you know, kind of give my opinion on each one. Now on his list, he has at number 10, uh, something that I would have probably put a lot higher. And that's failing to invest adequately in the offensive line, which... <laughs> I mean, that's that's a mouthful right there. I, I don't I don't really know how that could have been this far down. I'm thinking this was just 10 options and then you vote at the bottom. But to me, this really is one of the the, the fatal flaws in Ron Rivera's you know scheme to rebuild the team. In my opinion, this really kind of roots itself in who they chose to be the offensive line coach uh, coming in the door. John Matsko. You know, he was well-respected around the league, but also a bit of a dinosaur in the fact of, you know, he really has been around too long and maybe some things have passed him, you know, by. Maybe it's a situation where Rivera kind of, you know, let his loyalty make his decisions again. But it's very telling uh, for us to end the season with Sam Cosme being really, you know, the only one on the offensive line that's keepable. Number nine in this list, he has cutting Dustin Hopkins for Chris Blewett. And I must say that I'm much like this article was, I was thinking that Hopkins needed some competition coming into that training camp. I remember the year before he was, he had some moments that were really, really bad, but it led to them bringing in Chris Blewett. And I, I think there was another guy they brought in. I can't, his name is escaping my mind right now, but Chris Blewett had the, the worst name in the history of, of, of place kickers. And he definitely blew his chance. I think most people would remember that Dustin Hopkins actually went on to have a couple more decent years with the Chargers. Number eight on his list, using players in the wrong position or in the wrong scheme. And he goes on to point out, you know, Landon Collins playing at safety when everybody knew he was better at linebacker. William Jackson being brought in as a guy who specializes in mainly man coverage, but being forced into being a zone, you know, uh, defensive back, which he's not good in. You know, then they draft Emmanuel Forbes, who's known to be, you know, a guy that specializes in zone, and they forced him into man. And they kept Cosme at right tackle, which obviously wasn't a good fit. And then they moved him over to guard, and now he's really, you know, this season really showing what he's got. And it goes on and on, like he talks about Antonio Gibson, Jamin Davis, Khalid Hudson, who I've talked about multiple times on this, on this channel. I actually did a film breakdown on Jamin Davis, maybe his first or second game, and talked about... Um, you know, his processing speed being off and not being up to par to be a middle linebacker. I actually got beat up kind of bad in the comments on that, but hey, I stick to my guns on that and he agreed with me. Number seven on his list is actually a big one, allowing Kevin O'Connell to get away. And of course, he's bringing light to the fact that instead of Rivera taking Kevin O'Connell and using him as the offensive coordinator there for at least a year, a guy that had already had a little time with Dwayne Haskins, uh, he should have, you know, probably known some of the things going on with Haskins if he could develop them or if he couldn't. But instead, you know, Rivera went with, with Scott Turner, who, if you've been paying attention to Rivera's career, Norv Turner is kind of a mentorish thing there. And the fact that he stuck with Scott Turner for three seasons, even though after, I believe after season two, we all knew that he was just not the answer. And he allowed Kevin O'Connell to go somewhere else. Now, I did see down the comments on this article, they were discussing about this. They were saying maybe Kevin O'Connell wouldn't have been interested in uh, the, the Redskin job with, you know, him knowing some of the, the limits on Dwayne Haskins or some of the, the, you know, the limited capabilities that Haskins had at that point, which could be a thing. It sucks that we'll never get to know the answer to any of this. The next one on the list, number six, is pretty big too. Drafting reach first and second round projects and trading up for a long snapper. 
Now, while I believe that the jury is still out on players like Forbes and, and Quan Martin, you know, it, it's really hard to argue the points with players like, you know, Phil Mathis and, you know, Jamin Davis. And I, I believe Cosby may end up turning out to be a really good second round pick. One of the only ones this team has made in, in several years. And I think that people look at Dotson more along the lines of they already had Terry McLaurin. And then they took him, you know, 16th, and then he didn't have that much production this year. So people think that he made a massive reach with them, which could be a, a fact. You know, some people had Dotson a little higher or a little lower in that first round. Fact is, they, you know, they traded back in that round and, and they, they grabbed who was, quote unquote, their guy. In year one, Dotson was, was up there and, and touchdown catches. But in year two, he did have a, a sophomore slump, you know, whatever you want to look at it in. But there are several players. You can't argue the fact there are several players that have already hit bust status. You know, Mathis, his his name and his face comes to mind instantly because he's had a hard time staying on the field or a hard time getting to the field after getting injured. But the fact is, Jamin Davis really, you know, and Emmanuel Forbes really write the book on this one. I believe Forbes, if he would have been used the way that his skill set sits, he probably would have had a bigger impact this year. But Davis, you know, it's taken him a couple years and he's just now catching up to being where he should be to be, you know, one of the one of the outside linebackers, not be the middle guy. He's just not a Mike linebacker, at least not at this point in his career anyway. The whole Cameron Cheeseman situation is so strange. Like, first of all, how do you trade up for a long snapper? Long snapper is literally that that position. It's a specialty position. You know, you end up with guys who have done it for years who teams will stick with, but it's not a position you draft really for it. And to trade up and then draft a guy is wild. And then to have this guy, he did pretty good his first year, I thought. And then to have him change up his snapping motion, which is what he was doing, and and, and it did not work. And, and I don't know what happened if he if they if they, why didn't they just tell him to go back to the way he used to snap? I don't know. Maybe he did and it didn't work. I, I saw uh, Trust Way talk about it, and it was a big confliction all year long. And then finally they let him go after just causing unbelievable amounts of problems, but that was definitely an issue, and it definitely should rank on this list. And next, he's got number five, letting his chief talent evaluator get away. Now, mind you, the author of this article's screen name on Hog Saban is Kyle Smith for GM, so he's a little bit jaded, but he's got solid points with this one because Kyle Smith was definitely, you know, a rising star in the front office of the Washington franchise, the Washington football team, the Redskins, if you would. He definitely was a guy that most people who were paying attention to that front office were kind of looking at as like the one shining star that had kind of stuck through all of Danny's mess, you know, and he had been promoted from, you know, lower, you know, lower stuff and was kind of looking like he was going to be the next guy. And then Rivera just came right on in and you know took complete charge of football operations and started to shuffle guys out and kyle smith ended up being one of those guys he ended up with atlanta and i actually think he's done a pretty good job down there and he didn't take very long you know in between jobs it didn't take him very long at all for somebody to pick him back up and i actually think that he might even be a candidate for this gm job now i i do not believe He's going to be the number one chief candidate, but he's definitely a guy that, you know, is going to be on the list. Now, number four on this list is still a head scratcher to me, but at the moment, everybody in the world thought this was a good idea. Pursuing a massive trade for Russell Wilson. Now, nobody really knows if the rumors and any of this is really true or not, but the way that all of the rumor mill was going was is that Washington was offering like multiple number ones and you know, it was just, this was just some craziness. And then, you know, to think what Russ would have wanted to be able to, to re-sign or sign a new deal with, you know, the trade and sign that they had going on is just unreal. And then, honestly, I, we're all thankful that Russ just backed out of the the deal or backed out of any any kind of thought of coming to Washington, you know, and, 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 and didn't want to be with the football team. And, and I was actually glad, he's, Russ is from my hometown, and I was actually glad 
that that big contract and, a, and an aging player who was, in my opinion, a good, not great, um, systematic piece over there in Seattle. You know, it seems to me like maybe they got out just in time. But the contract he ended up signing with Denver, I mean, he's getting dumped out of it now because they're scared he may get hurt again and they end up having to pay like $40 million or whatever it is next year, which is nuts. I mean, that contract was crazy to begin with. But I have to say Washington dodged a bullet with that. And if, you know, Ron Rivera was ready to run, you know, guns out without even thinking about it into that one to get that quarterback, you know, you have to kind of sit back now and, you know, kind of, second guess it and look at it and say wow that was a dumb move but in the moment there were a lot of people that wanted that to happen number three on this list he has allowing carson wentz to start against the browns in 2022 now i remember when this happened and everybody was mesmerized about why at that point he would stick carson wentz in i remember thinking to myself okay well he's trying to you know prove to himself if Wentz is that guy for next year. And I was trying to convince myself thinking that and just, you know, I had all the film right there in front of me. So I'm sitting there watching Carson Wentz's film and I'm seeing how the team played with him in, you know, and there were, there were some moments when they did decent, but for the most part, I think it was a dumb decision to go away like he did and to play Carson Wentz in that game. It just, it didn't make any sense, you know, and that loss to the Browns actually cost them a shot at the playoffs that year. So, you know, and, and this kind of makes me remember even more about how he had the thing in the, the news, the press conference, you know, where he, he said, he, oh, we, we could be eliminated. It was just just a funky set of situations that went down and made him look completely inept. And number two on his list, he has vastly overpaying for Carson Wentz. And, you know, they gave up way too much for Wentz. Thankfully, they ended up having to give up more because uh, he didn't play as much time. No thanks to Rivera there because he probably would have played him all the way through that even if Carson would have been struggling if he, if he had not hurt his finger. But I can't argue with, with number two there. But then at number one, he's got failing to draft a quarterback in 2020 and drafting Chase Young. Now, revisionist history has kind of gone around and played around in this particular subject line for quite a few people. Now, I will say that I don't believe that Kyle Smith for GM here, the guy that wrote this article, I don't believe he's one of the people that's re, you know revising what he said before. I actually believe that he did not want Chase Young to be drafted. He wanted to get a quarterback. But, you know, revisionist history kind of leads a lot of people to look at this one and say, there's no reason that we ever should have drafted Chase Young. And it's, everybody always is quick to forget how much of a beast Chase Young was coming out of college and what everybody thought he'd be a difference maker. I remember also thinking to myself, why in the hell are we taking another edge rusher here when we already have Montez Sweat over there that we've paid, you know, a first round draft pick. We moved up to take Montez Sweat in that, that same draft we took Dwayne Haskins. And to me, it was a bit of a head scratcher to think, why would we want to do that? You know, and then we'd have to end up paying both of them and, you know, back-to-back -back years and it, it was just a whole bunch of craziness in that whole situation plus we'd end up having to pay the defensive tackles we'd already drafted you know a whole lot of people around the league were saying man y'all are going to have the fearsome force some blah 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 and i remember thinking to myself maybe this isn't the best move you know but i also remember justin herbert not being you know a known thing a, a definite thing there was a lot of question marks about what he was going to do as well so I believe the quarterback that they probably would have taken would have been Tua from, from, uh, from Alabama. And that one was a bit of a hairy situation too because he had some injury situations and everybody was kind of hesitant on him. So to me, the 2020 draft picking that high, yeah, I think maybe it, definitely you can look back on it and say that was a bad choice to take Chase Young now being the fact that you can look back and see what has happened in his career or what happened with him, even though I still believe to this point right now that letting him walk or, or trading him away as they did was probably not the smart thing to do. Guys like that, you probably should hold on to and see 
what happens. There's gonna be a lot of people that disagree with me on that and that's fine. But the truth of the matter is a lot of people always, when they look back on this and try to play revisionist, they always say we should have taken Herbert when there was so many question marks about Herbert back then, that's not even the player that they should have taken or would have been in line to take. Now, can you make an argument to say they could have traded back and, and still gotten a big name? Sure. Could you say that they could have, you know, stacked some extra picks there? Sure. And we all know that there's been a lot of, you know, articles and reports and everything else that have came out stating that, that, uh, the Daniel Snyder is the one that really pushed the envelope for Chase Young to be the guy selected at number two. So while I do agree with the fact that it was probably either, if it wasn't the number one thing, it was definitely the number two worst thing that, that Ron Rivera did while he was in DC. If you look at the poll here under the article and you'll see that a lot of people agree that uh, the failing to invest adequately in the offensive line probably should have been a little higher on the list. Like I said before, I think he just named the top 10 things that people have said along the line and then put it to votes and see what everybody would say. But going by the poll, they said, number one, failing to draft a quarterback in 2020 and drafting Chase Young. Number two, failing to invest adequately in the offensive line. Number three would have been vastly overpaying for Carson Wentz. Number four would have been drafting reach first and second round projects and trading up for a long snapper. Number four would have been letting his chief talent evaluator get away. Number five would have been allowing Carson Wentz to start against the Browns. You have a tie for the next three with considering a massive trade for Russell Wilson, allowing Kevin O'Connell to get away and using playing in the wrong position or in the right scheme. Cutting Dustin Hopkins for Chris Blewett and something else got uh, lower than, than 2%. But you know, whenever I do videos like this or, I, or I, I put a post up on Facebook talking about Ron Rivera, there's always a couple people in the comments that want to tell me about how great of a person Ron Rivera is, you know, what he had to deal with, who he's had to deal with, the situation with Snyder and the media and everything else, and that, you know, he's done this the, the right way and that the right way, and that I shouldn't judge him based on what he's done on the field. Well, see, I have a problem with that. The problem is, is that he's a coach. He's also been, you know, the guy that's been in charge of, you know, the talent. So it's all on him. It all falls at his feet. And he makes a lot of money to field football teams week in and week out and do his job as well along the way. And he has not been doing a stand-up job of it. He has not even been doing a mediocre job of it. I mean, that team has four wins this year. You know, if you look at his his uh, his record in his career, the guy is literally fighting for a 500 record in this game that Washington will be playing tomorrow against Dallas. That's as mediocre as you can get. And I've said over and over again that I've thought that, you know, when they hired him, that maybe he was the best and maybe only person that would take the job at that point. But the, the thing is, though, is that that's a different situation now. Now with a different ownership team in place and a plan, I believe, that they've been putting together for months now, this guy is, is on borrowed time. I honestly think they should have let go of him weeks ago, but I get the approach of keeping him around and you know, you don't want people thinking that you're just in here with an itchy trigger finger or you're something like that Carolina owner over there who just, you know, hires coaches and fires them less than, you know, what, 10 weeks later. You can't let an owner come in and be labeled like that. Otherwise, he'll be looked at just the same way as Snyder was. So it's good to see them do that. Coming in and doing things too fast, it just gives everybody the wrong impression. It makes them look, you know, bad. It's good to see them take some patience, take some time, and make the right decisions. Well, hopefully they make the right decisions. I believe they will. But they really need to nail this GM hire and then go from there. Let that GM put his vision out there for everybody else to see by hiring his coach and doing the things he wants to do with this football team. But at any rate, I'm going to put the link to this article down in the, in the comments. Go check it out and check my guys out over at Hogshaven. They always put out some great content. Y'all take it easy. Peace.